Good evening. We're going to start our last Odyssey in Equilibrium today. So we are going to be dealing with buffers. In our previous unit, we have talked about acids and bases. We talked about the equilibria of weak acids and weak bases. We talked about salt hydrolysis, and we talked about titrations. Now we're going to put all those together and see how that will affect our buffered solutions. So for this unit, the learning objectives are listed out to the side. We have a buffer solution resists changes to its pH when small amounts of acid or base are added. We can explain the relationship between the ability of a buffer to stabilize pH and the reactions that occur when an acid or a base is added to a buffered solution. We can identify the pH of a buffered solution based on the identity and concentrations of the conjugate acid base pair used to create the buffer. And finally, we can explain the relationship between the buffering capacity of a solution and the relative concentrations of the conjugate acid or and conjugate base components of the solution. So a buffer is a solution that lessens the impact of pH from the addition of an outside acid or base. Basically, the best thing you can do to think about this is a Le Chatelier's principle example. The acid-base buffer usually consists of a conjugate acid or base pair where both species are present in appreciable quantities in the solution. So again, we're talking about having a surplus of both the conjugate acid or conjugate base and the weak acid or weak base within that solution. That way, if we have the addition of an acid or a base, we have something present on each side that can fend it off. The acid-base buffer is therefore a solution of a weak acid in its conjugate base or a weak base in its conjugate acid. So the major takeaways that you're going to have for your buffered solutions. The first, the purpose of the buffer is to resist a change in pH. A lot of your medicines that you would take, a lot of the pharmaceuticals that you have uh, are buffered solutions. So they want to make sure that they are found in a narrow pH range. So typically what you're going to find is that buffered solution is good plus or minus one for the pH, typically. Um, when we talk about what composes the buffers, again, we have a weak acid or a weak base containing a common ion. So I'm going to take a moment and I'm going to hit that for a uh, beginning example problem. So I'm going to take my acid here and I'm just going to use HNO2 and I'm going to use my salt, which is what we need, a a salt containing the anion that would be the same. So when I react both of these with water, I have HNO2 and H2O forming the H3O plus and the NO2 minus. And then for the salt, NaNO2, when we place that into water, again, that would form Na plus and NO2 minus ions. So hopefully you can see here I have the two separate sources of the NO2 minus. So that allows me to have a large surplus of the NO2 and a large surplus of the HNO2. So now whenever we add an outside acid or a base, we can first off take care of the stoichiometry and then once we figured out how much has been neutralized of either the NO2 minus in this case or the HNO2 we can then plug that back into our equilibrium expression. You kind of got a taste for that when we did our um, pH during the titrations for that strong weak example last week in class. Uh, we didn't talk about it in terms of buffers or using the equation for buffers, you just used it for the equilibrium and you can solve for those things every single time. So if I look at an outside source, just to give you guys a concrete example so you can identify what's taking place, if I add extra OH- minus to my reaction, now you can see that the OH- minus with my equilibrium system, which I always want to focus on the weak acid ionizing in water or the weak base ionizing in water, the OH minus, it's not going to affect the acid, but just think about Le Chatelier's principle. What would the OH minus react with? It's going to react with the H3O plus. And so as it reduces the amount of H3O plus from the solution, that is going to cause more of the HNO2 to dissociate and will cause the reaction to shift towards the right. As more OH- minus gets added, more of the HNO2 will dissociate to neutralize that OH- minus until eventually 
it's all gone, and then it would reestablish equilibrium. Now, if we have something else that we add to the solution, so say now instead of the H, OH minus, now let's add the H3O plus. Let me pop that in a different color here real quick. So if I now go to add H3O plus to my reaction, now the H3O plus will be able to react with the NO2 minus and by combining together to form more of the HNO2, it will drive the reaction back in the reverse direction. So I have a source that can allow me to absorb the extra H3O plus, which would be my conjugate acid, or my conjugate base, oh, excuse me. And then I have the acid that could further dissociate to absorb the outside base. So again, deal with the stoichiometry first, figure out how much has been lost or gained from your buffered solution for the moles, and then you can uh, reestablish the equilibrium from those concentrations. Now let's look at one more example for this common ion effect. So when we look at acetic acid dissociating in water, you can see that we have the acetate ion and H3O plus that will form the equilibrium reaction. When we add the sodium acetate to the solution, it's going to provide that extra source of the CH3COO8O minus ions, and that is going to cause the equilibrium to shift back towards the left and form more of the acetic acid molecules. So one of the things that you'll notice is that the percent dissociation for the acid is going to decrease when that common ion is added in. So we can now look at how a buffer will work in solution with a particle diagram. So when we talk about buffers, we have something that you're going to see, which is called an ideal buffer. And an ideal buffer is one where you have equal concentrations of both the anion for the acid and the acid itself. So when we look at this initial picture in the middle, you can see that the buffer has equal concentrations of both the HA and the A minus. So you can see I have four particles each when that takes place. So you can see now with that taking place, when I add extra H3O plus as I shift it to the left, you can notice that now as I add the H3O plus, my number of A minus ions in the solution has dropped because one of them has absorbed the H3O plus that was added, which caused the concentration of the CH3COOH, the acetic acid, to increase, but not enough of the H3O plus was added to completely consume all of the different A minus ions. So as long as you still have some left over for both the conjugate base and the weak acid, or the conjugate acid and the weak base, you will still have an effective buffer. Same type of thing if I add the OH minus ions to the solution. Now, in that situation, notice that some of the HA has split apart. It's not showing the H3O plus in the solution, but the OH minus has reacted with the H3O plus to form water. And as a result, the amount of acetic acid has dropped in the process. I now have a larger concentration, if you count three of the acetic acid molecules, I have five of the acetate ions now instead of four and four. So again, still have some left. So we've successfully fended off the addition of a base and an acid within this solution. Now let's discuss the ways that we can make a buffer. The first one is we can mix a weak acid and a salt of its conjugate base, or a weak base and a salt of its conjugate acid. So what we mean by that is literally I can pour out a certain volume of that weak acid, I can go back into the stock room, pull off the shelf, a bottle of the solid salt, and then just simply take some of that solid salt and add it to that weak acid and dissolve it. And that will create a buffer. The second is a way that you can do it based off of the lab situation. So when we we're talking about titrations, we briefly discussed it, but if you only partially neutralize a weak acid or a weak base by adding a strong acid or a strong base to that. You can neutralize part of the weak base and form some of the salt 
in the process for that neutralization reaction. And so as long as it does not reach the equivalence point where your moles of acid equals your moles of base and equals your moles of salt, then you would have a buffered solution. Let's now do a quick concept check just to make sure that we're all on the same page. So how will the equilibrium shift when NaCN is added to the solution? So take a moment, pause the video, and go ahead and try to answer this question. Write out the dissociation equation for the sodium cyanide to help you figure it out. Okay, so if we now look at our reaction, if I were to add the salt, I have NaCN going into the water and that will produce Na plus and Cn minus. So if you recall, the sodium coming from a strong base is just a spectator ion, will not do anything, but I have a common ion of the Cn minus. So according to Le Chatelier's principle, since this concentration is going to increase, think about in terms of Q versus K, the products are too large, so in order to reestablish equilibrium, the reaction would have to shift to the left. We're now going to look at how the relative concentrations of the components within a buffered system compare to each other. So we're going to once again look at the acetic acid reaction where we're forming the acetate ion and the H3O+. Now the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a shortcut to kind of help you figure these things out a little bit more easily within our reaction. So when we talk about the equilibrium expression, we have the concentration of the acetate ion, the CH3COO minus, and the H3O plus, and we have the acetic acid molecules. Remember, water, because it's a liquid, will not count. It will just be incorporated into the Ka value. So if you notice, when I'm looking at this, I have CH3COO minus times H3O plus over the acetic acid CH3COOH, and I'm just going to label these here just a little bit. So this part right here, that represents my base, and the part on the bottom represents the acid. So if we want to solve for pH, remember the H3O+, plus, if we try to isolate it, we would have to multiply both sides by the acetic acid. So you notice now this is in the numerator. So I'm going to put my acid over here. And then I have my base, and I would have to divide both sides by the acetate ion. So that gives me a general formula that we can use where we have the H3O plus or the H plus equals the Ka times the ratio of the acid over the base. And conversely, if we need to figure out OH minus, we could take the Kb value and then multiply that times the base over the acid. Now, the one part that's really nice about this little shortcut that I'm showing you is the fact that you can just simply take and figure out your number of moles. You don't have to go back in when you are doing the addition of the acids or the bases, you don't have to go back in and figure out what the molarities are because you're dividing each equally, both the numerator and the denominator, by the same volume. It makes it redundant. So you can actually, in this shortcut, the shortcut is okay to use moles. So you do not have to use molarity. So now when we look at this, hopefully it makes sense. If I have for my ratio, the HA concentration being greater than the A minus concentration, then my H3O plus is going to increase. And conversely, if my HA over A minus ratio decreases, then my H3O plus decreases. Because again, I'm multiplying the Ka, which is a constant, by that ratio to have it equal the H3O plus. Now, the other really nice thing, when I have equal concentrations, so when HA is equal to A minus, this is again what we talked about a minute ago with that ideal buffer, and for that ideal buffer, the pH will equal the pKa, or we could say that the H plus concentration equals the Ka concentration. 
So it makes it really easy as a starting point to kind of figure out where our pH is when we're creating our buffers if we're using the ideal solutions. So if we take our shortcut equation where we had the H plus concentration equals Ka times the concentration of the acid divided by the concentration of the base and we take the negative log of the entire thing, we get what is commonly known as the Henderson-Hasselbeck equation. This is an equation that only applies to buffers. So the typical acid-base equilibria that we talked about last unit, unless it has a conjugate base that has been added into the solution, we are not able to use that as part of our equation. So when we look at this, I can have the negative log of the H+, plus, so that would give me the negative log of H+, plus, which we commonly refer to as pH, equals the negative log of the Ka, which would be, again, the pKa, just for short. And now that would also give me, because of our rules for logarithms, I would have the log of the minus the log of the acid over the base. Because that's a minus, again, we can look at this here. Um, I have the acid over the base, but I can just invert the ratio to get it to be a positive for the log, and that would give me the log of the base over the acid. So if you're wondering why it's flipped in here, it's because the negative log is what we normally take, and because they just had it as a plus, it made it as the base over the acid. Now, you could leave it as minus the log over the acid or, uh, over the base. I just always hated using that equation because I could never remember what was supposed to go on top or bottom when I was doing the plus or the minus. So using this as your shortcut is by far the easiest thing to do. So now let's go ahead and look at a couple of example problems. All right, so I'm gonna do this a couple different ways for you just so you can kind of see how everything works out. It says what is the pH of a buffered solution that is 0.45 molar acetic acid and 0.85 molar sodium acetate. The Ka for the acetic acid is 1.8 times 10 to the minus fifth. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to use the rice table just to kind of help set up our problem. So I have the CH3COOH. I have that reacting with H2O forming the H3O plus and the acetate ion CH3COO O minus. So in this process for my initial concentration I have 0.45 molar and I have 0.85 molar. Now the one other thing that I want you guys to notice is again my concentration of the acid is less than my concentration of the base. So as a result, whatever the pKa is, I'm going to expect my final answer to be higher than what that pKa is, uh, would be for the ideal buffer. So when I look at my rice table here, again, setting up that initial part, we haven't invaded anything yet. So I can have 0.85 and 0.45 for my initial and my equilibrium concentrations. So I can take solving for the H3O plus, rearranging everything. Again, I have the Ka of my acid over my base. So for this first part, again, solving for H3O plus, I have this equaling 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth. And then I can plug that in and I would have the acid 0.45 molar over 0.85 molar. So my H3O plus concentration is going to be 9.53 times 10 to the negative sixth. And then if I take the negative log of X to have that equal to pH, that will equal 5.02. So my final pH will be 5.02. So now I can go back and I can plug in my Henderson Hasselbeck as my second option. Now, just a point of reference for you guys. 
the Henderson Hasselbeck equation is no longer required for you guys to use on the AP exam. If you choose to use it, that's great. You can, but you can always answer the question using this shortcut equation that I showed you just a few minutes ago. So I can have the pH equals the pKa plus the log of the base, in this case, the A minus over the acid, HA. So when I do this here to solve for pH, I can take the negative log of 1.8 times 10 to the minus fifth, and I can add to that the log of 0.85 divided by 0.45. So if I plug in negative log 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth, that is equal to 4.74. And then I can add to that the log of 0.85 divided by 0.45. Since that number is greater than one, that will give me a positive log and that will equal 0.276. So when I add those two together, 5.02. Same answer using the other method but just a little bit different in how we get there. So whether you choose to use the Henderson Hasselbeck or that little shortcut equation, completely up to you. Now we're gonna focus on buffering capacity. The buffering capacity is a measure of the strength of the buffer, its ability to maintain the pH following the addition of a strong acid or a base. So when we're talking about the buffering capacity, we're literally just describing how large the concentrations are and the greater the concentration of the buffering components, again the acid or the salt or the base or the salt, the greater its capacity to resist changes in pH. So one other thing that I'm going to mention is that the greater the concentration, the smaller the change in pH will be. So you can um, also think about the closer the component concentrations are to each other, the greater the buffering capacity will be. You can kind of think about this from a cross-curricular type of standpoint. Many of you guys are taking U.S. history at the same time that you're taking AP chemistry. And so you can think about the Revolutionary War or the Civil War, where a lot of the battles were fought not in the trenches or anything else but you had these great lines of people just standing row after row after row and they would just trade shots the more people that you had standing next to you and standing behind you the stronger your lines would be and the less likely that your lines would falter and you'd have the enemy being able to go straight through your lines and flank you so you can kind of think about that the greater the concentrations of those buffers components the acid in the base, when that outside influence, the other acid or base, strong acid or base that's being added, just like the enemy, can't break through the line because once you overtake that buffering capacity, the pH is either going to go skyrocketing up or down based off of whether you're adding the acid or the base. So having the ability to have large concentrations definitely makes it a more effective buffer. Now, from the buffering capacity just like using that little warfare scenario you're always as strong as your weakest link so having those closer component concentrations makes it a better buffer so just as an example if i had two buffers both made up of say hclo2 and kclo2 and my first buffer had say a concentration of 0 0.10 molar hclo2 and 0 0.10 molar KClO2. In that situation, I could fend off the addition of the 0.1 molar H plus or OH minus coming in either direction. Whereas in a second one, if I had 0 0.10 molar HClO2 and then only 0 0.010 molar KClO2. Now, the addition of the base would be exactly the same. I could still add less than 0.1 molar for the base, and I would have enough to fend it off. But if I added an acid to that, now I only have 0.01 moles of, or molar concentration. We can assume we have one liter for this, 
just to make it easy, and I would have 0 0.010 moles. So let's just say we have one liter of solution. I could have 0 0.010 moles of the acid added, but after 0 0.01 moles, it would now be the acid in excess and I would have no more of the salt to negate it, and so we'd see the pH dropping. So the optimal buffer occurs when, again, the HA concentration is equal to the A minus. It is for this condition that the ratio A minus over HA is most resistant to change when the H plus or the OH minus is added to your buffered solution. So typically, again, the range for your buffers is going to be the pH for that ideal buffer, plus or minus one. So if you think about that unit, that would basically mean that we'd have a one to 10 ratio, or we'd have a 10 to one ratio. All right, so we'll go and talk about the buffering range. Again, that's the pH range over which the buffer is effective. The buffer range is related to the ratio of the buffer component's concentration. The closer the concentration for uh, HA over A minus is to one, the more effective the buffer. The concentration of one component is more than 10 times the concentration of the other. That buffering action is poor. Since the log of 10 equals one, buffers have a usable range within plus or minus one pH units of the pKa of the acid component. So let's now look at the creation of a buffer throughout the titration process. So we're going to look at the reaction between NH3 and HCl. It's going to form NH4Cl and water. We have for this weak base strong acid titration, you have an initial pH starting off at 11. The major species in the solution at this point are going to be NH3 molecules. There'll be a little bit of the NH4+, but not very much at all. But we have a majority being the NH3+. As the titration begins, we start to add in the HCl. We're going to get the Cl- in solution. We're going to begin to get the NH4+, as more of the hydrogens are donated to the ammonia. And we create this buffered region. You can see here, basically, somewhere between about 10 and 8. There's our plus or minus 2 uh, for that or plus or minus one to give us that buffered region where it will be effective. And so I have the initial concentration of the NH3 beginning to drop. You see that little hook right there, and then it levels out. As that's occurring, I have the NH4 plus increasing. And when we reach the halfway point of the titration, that is going to tell us where we have, in this case, the NH3 and the NH4 plus concentrations being equal to each other. And so if you think about that little description that we talked about where we have the base over the acid, if these two things are equal to each other, then that would tell me that this ratio of the base over the acid would be essentially one to one. And so at that point, my pOH would equal my Kb. So you can always use the halfway point to just simply take the titration curve data and say, okay, here's my uh, halfway point. And you can just figure that out where your volume is, go down, that's your equivalence point, it's at 40. So I could come up to where it's 20 and that would tell me what the pH would be at the equivalence point. And so you could do pH equals the H plus, pOH equals the OH minus in terms of the concentrations at that particular point within the reaction. So that is something you can always do halfway to the equivalence point. You always know pH will equal pKa or the pOH equals the pKb 100% of the time. The pH at the equivalence point is going to be less than 7 this time because we are adding a strong acid to that weak base. So I'm going to have the acidic salt, NH4Cl, that will form. I would choose the methyl red indicator in this particular case because it's going to be between 4 and 6 where I see that nice color change. And again, remember the way how we would tell the pH at the equivalence point, we'd use the salt hydrolysis, go back and see how the NH4 plus would react with water to reform the ammonia and then do our salt calculation for 
um, what the pH would be. I had mentioned in the previous video that I was going to come back and do a little bit with the titrations for a weak polyprotic acid. So in this particular instance, I gave you an example of sulfurous acid being titrated with NaOH. So just a couple of things here. Uh, you'll notice that the total volume that we would expect for the complete neutralization of the H2SO3 is exactly double what the initial constant, uh, what the initial volume is for the H2SO3. Notice I have equal molar concentrations, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, but since I have two ionizable hydrogens compared to only one base, I'm going to need twice as much of the base. So that's why my volume at the uh, final equivalence point is 80. Each of the equivalence points will require the exact same volume since I'm adding the exact same amount of the NaOH. But the big key thing is just kind of think about this as being two separate weak acid strong base titration curves that are combined together. So I'm starting off where I have nothing but the H2SO3. I get a small little rise in the initial uh, concentration of the OH minus and so that causes the pH to increase. It levels off and again I have this nice, bu uh, nice buffer zone in the middle here. I can see where my H2SO3 is equal to my HSO3 minus. So that'll be my first ideal buffer point. Notice again half of 40 is 20. So I could go over and see that my pH is just slightly below 2, 1.85. And so I would then continue adding I get to my first equivalence point where the pH is 4.52 and when I have the second pH uh, that or the second range that starts up from there now I'm starting to neutralize the HSO3 minus so my second halfway point where I have my K, pKa2 equaling the pH is when the HSO3 minus and the SO3 2 minus are now equivalent to each other. So again, we're having the HSO3 minus acting as the new acid, going to form the HSO3 2 minus. And so I have a second buffered region for these two ions that are present in solution. Once that finally gets exceeded, again, you'll notice this one is occurring at 60. That's halfway between 40 and 80. And eventually I get to the second equivalence point at 9.86 where all of the ionizable hydrogens have now been neutralized. All right, so now we're going to look and see which buffer has the highest pH. So again, the molecular scenes below represent samples of four different HA A minus buffers. The HA is the blue and green, the A minus is the green, and all the other ions and water are not shown. So again, since I'm starting with a weak acid system, again, when it's equal the, uh, for the concentrations of HA and A minus, the pH would equal the pKa. So when I'm looking for this, I want to have the highest number of A minus ions that are in the solution. So if I look here at scene one, I have one, two, three for the acids. So I'm just going to put three A's and I have one, two, three for the bases, for that conjugate base. So three acids, three bases. So that's going to be an ideal buffer type of situation. When I look at the scene two, I have now four acid molecules and only two base molecules. In scene three, I have one, two, three, four for the acids. And I have one, two, three, four for the bases. So I have an ideal buffer situation again. And then finally, I have two acids and I have four bases. So one, two, three, four versus one and two. So the scene that would give me the highest pH is going to be the one that I have the greatest number of base molecules. And so in that case, scene four would be the correct choice. As far as which buffer has the greatest capacity, 
Now in that situation, again, I want to look not only for just sheer concentrations, but also which gives me the ratio closest to one. So I have two good options. They each contain six total particles for scenes one, two, and four. I have eight total particles for scene three, but since it's four acid and four base molecules, scene three would be the best. And then finally, should we add a small amount of concentrated strong acid or strong base to convert sample one to sample two, assuming no volume changes? So in this particular instance, because I have three A and three Bs in terms of the components of system one, and then when I look at system two, I now have four acid molecules and only two bases, it would make sense that we would want to be adding a strong acid to that scene one because now one of the a minuses would react with the h3o plus and it would form another ha molecule so in that instance my base molecules would decrease my acid molecules would increase All right, so which of these conjugate acid-base pairs will not function as a buffer? So we have C2H5COOH and C2H5COO minus, HCO3 minus and CO3 two minus, or HNO3 and NO3 minus. Explain. So we always want to be focusing, do we have the conjugate acid or the conjugate base of the weak acid or a base? So when we look at the first example, that does because all I have lost is the one hydrogen here. So that one does work. When I look at the HCO3 minus and the CO3 two minus, again, if I take away that one ionizable hydrogen off the HCO3 minus, then those two would be correct conjugate acid base pairs. And if I look at my last one, I have HNO3 and NO3 minus. If I remove that H, all I'm left with is the NO3 minus. However, we have one problem. When we look at the HNO3, by definition, it is a strong acid. And because it's a strong acid, it would never have equilibrium. So the HNO3 will not work as a buffer because the HNO3 is a strong acid and the NO3 minus would just be a spectator ion. Now, when we look at this here, again, all the following pairs will not function as buffers. That is correct. The part B is incorrect because again, this would not act as a spectator ion because it is the conjugate base of a weak acid. It would react with water and hydrolyze it and go back towards the parent acid. The HCO3 and CO3 two minus will not work as a buffer because HCO3 is a weak acid and HCO3 minus is a spectator ion. I think that's meant to be CO3 two minus there. And that is also incorrect. So the only thing that is correct would be the HNO3 and the NO3 minus will not work. HNO3 being a strong acid, NO3 minus being a spectator ion. Okay, so let's look at one more example. So what happens when NaOH is added to a buffer composed of CH3COOH and CH3COO minus? So I have the acetate and the acetic acid uh, present inside of that buffered solution. So by adding the NaOH, your choices, there is no reaction between the acetate ion and acetic acid to form a buffer, uh, or because it is forming a buffer. Uh, the NaOH reacts with the acetate ion, converting some of it into the parent acid, acetic acid. The NaOH reacts with the acetic acid to convert some of it into the uh, acetate ion. And finally, the NaOH is neutralized in all concentrations. HC, uh, the acetic acid and the acetate ion remain unchanged. So take a moment, answer it, pause the video, go ahead and answer the question. And as we get to our final answer here, the correct choice would be C. 
There is no reaction between the acetate ion and the acetic acid forming a buffer. Uh, that is true that there is a buffer that's formed, but the Le Chatelier's principle, the OH- will definitely react. Uh, the choice B looks like a logical choice, except for the fact that you're reacting the NaOH, which is a base, with the acetate ion which is your conjugate base. You can't have a base plus a base forming the acid. So we know that that one is incorrect. Choice C, the NaOH reacts with the acetic acid. That makes sense because I have the OH minus and the H plus reacting together to form water and it would produce more of the acetate ion. So that is completely true. And then finally, the NaOH is neutralized and that is true, but all the concentrations would not remain unchanged. Your acetic acid concentration, that would decrease. Your acetate ion, that would increase. So you can do that uh, in choice C is your correct answer. All right, so one last quick concept check question before we do a couple of mathematical problems. Uh, and for this one, the Ka values for nitrous acid and hypochlorous acid are 4.5 times 10 to the minus fourth and 3.0 times 10 to the minus eighth respectively. Which one would be more suitable for use in a solution buffered at a pH of seven? What other substances would be needed to make the buffer? So in this type of situation, remember we said that the pH for the buffer should equal the pKa plus or minus one. So if I look at my two choices, 4.5 times 10 to the minus four, if we figure out the pKa for that, if we do the negative log, 4.5 times 10 to the negative fourth, that is equal to, taking the negative log of that, that would give me 3.35. And then if I do the negative log of 3.0 times 10 to the negative eighth, negative log 3.0 times 10 to the negative eight, that gives us a pH equal to 7.52. So because the 7.52 would fall within one of the pH that is desired, the HClO would be the better choice. Now, to make this solution occur at the pH of seven, here's where we got to think about what we need to do. We need to drop the pH, so we need to add something that was going to make it more acidic. So we can have the HCl, uh, because it's the stronger weak acid, the salt containing the ClO minus is also added. That one is not true, because again, the HClO is actually the weaker of the two acids. The HNO2 has a larger Ka value, so that is not true. But I know I can eliminate both of the choices B and D just because they said we needed the HNO2. And then I can look at C. So I have HClO because it's pH, uh, pKa is closer to the pH of seven, so that is true. But a salt containing the ClO minus ion is also needed. Now, I'm gonna take it one step further and just simply say that we would want to make sure that the HClO concentration was greater than the ClO minus concentration. And you can actually do some math to figure out exactly what concentration would be needed to make that pH of seven. And that's just tinkering with the ratio of the acid to the salt. Sorry, I got one last problem to do from a multiple choice type of perspective. So uh, when we're calculating the pH, when a common ion is involved for the generic reaction, HA forming H plus plus A minus, which of the following statements is true. The equilibrium constant for this reaction changes as the pH changes. So uh, we can look at that. If you add the soluble salt Ka to a solution of HA that is at equilibrium, the concentration of HA would decrease. If you add the soluble salt Ka to a solution of HA that is at equilibrium, the concentration of A- minus would decrease. And finally, if you add the soluble salt Ka to a solution of HA that is at equilibrium, the pH would increase. So 
in this particular instance, we could have more than one correct answer. So let's just think about what would happen. If I have that soluble salt, Ka, that is going to dissolve into K plus and A minus ions. So for the first statement, the equilibrium constant for this reaction changes as the pH changes. That would be a false statement because remember, the only thing that affects K is temperature. So that one would be false. For the part B, if you add the soluble salt Ka to a solution of HA, that's at equilibrium, the concentration of HA would decrease. So again, by adding the A minus to that reaction, the Ka would give me more A minus, and that would make my reaction shift back to the left. So my HA concentration would not decrease it would increase. So B is not correct. If we look at C, if you add the soluble salt Ka to a solution of HA that is at equilibrium, the concentration of A- minus would decrease. Now, this is the one thing that I want you to be very careful about because the trap that a lot of people get into is they're thinking, okay, I'm adding A-, minus. that's going to make the reaction shift to the left, so my concentration of A- minus along with the H plus is going to decrease. But you have to keep in mind that we're talking about we had the A minus initially. The adding part doesn't count as far as the shifting is concerned. I'm still adding extra A minus, so I'm gonna have a larger ending amount, even though it does get a little smaller, but I'm gonna have a larger ending amount than I did to begin with. And so as a result, C would also be incorrect. And finally, if I add the soluble salt Ka to a solution of HA that's at equilibrium, the pH would increase. That is true. I'm adding a basic salt. So just remember, my amount of base is increasing. My amount of the H plus to produce the pH of the solution for us as it shifts to the left, the H plus concentration is going to drop. And so as a result, I'm going to have an increase in pH. So that would be true. Okay, so I want to do one last example problem for you where we can look at figuring out the pH for the initial buffered solution and then also the pH after we have added an additional outside acid or base. So to start off with, for part A, we're going to take the pH for a one liter solution containing 0.085 molar nitrous acid, Ka 4.5 times 10 to the minus fourth, and 0.1 molar potassium nitrite. So for the first part here, I'm gonna set up my expression. I have HNO2, I have H2O forming H3O plus and NO2 minus. So as a starting point, I know that at the equilibrium, again, we have 0.85 molar for the 0 0.85 molar for the nitrous acid, and we have 0.1 molar for the potassium nitrite. So you'll notice my initial concentration of the base. Okay, I'm just gonna write that over the top here and the acid. My initial concentration of the base is greater than the acid, so my pH should be slightly more than what the pKa is. So to solve for the H+, I'm going to take my Ka, 4.5 times 10 to the negative fourth, and I'm going to multiply that times my ratio of the acid, 0 0.085 over 0 0.10 for the base. So again, H plus, if you don't remember that formula, Ka times the acid over the base. All right, so if I just simply set that up in my expression, I have 4.5 times 10 to the negative fourth, and I'm gonna multiply that times 0 0.085 and divide that by 0 0.1. So what that ends up giving me is 3.85 times 10 to the, or 3.825, times 10 to the negative fourth as my H plus. So I can take the negative log of X in this case to solve for pH. So negative log of the answer gives us a pH of 
2 as our initial pH for the solution. So now we can move on to the part B. And I'm going to do the same thing here. And I'm going to set up a reaction where I have the NaOH forming the H2O and the NaNO2. So in this situation, I have initially 0.085 molar. We had a one liter solution. So for my rice table, I have initially 0.085 moles. For the sodium hydroxide, I was adding 0 0.010 liters times 0 0.50 molar. And so if I take that 0 0.5 times 0 0.01, that is equal to 0 0.005 moles. This is a minus x, this is a minus x, this is a plus x. So hopefully you can notice the same type of thing like we talked about with the titrations last week. The NaOH, that is my limiting reactant. So I know I'll have zero left at the end. So again, I'm doing my stoichiometry first, like I said at the very beginning of the video. Here I can take the 0 0.085 and I can subtract off the 0 0.005 and by doing that, I would have 0 .80, 0 0.080 moles that would be left. And for my NaNO2, because I'm adding X, I had initially uh, for that buffer, uh, I did not have any of the um, NaNO2 present, but that would give me 0 0.005 for the number of moles of the NaNO2. And again, remember, the NaNO2, sorry, my pen's lagging there. My NaNO2 would dissociate into Na plus and NO2 minus. So I'm having an additional 0 0.05005 moles of the NaNO2 or the NO2 minus. So I had initially, again, 0 0.10. So I can now add this amount to what I had present there. And so for my equilibrium reaction, I would now again subtract the 0 0.005 molar here, which gives me the 0 0.080. And then I can add the 0 0.005, which would give me 0 0.105. Now, in that situation, what makes it really easy, I could then take those two concentrations and I could plug that in. So for my part B, I could take the uh, amount that I have for the H plus equaling the Ka. And this is where I was saying is really nice. So we don't have to go back and calculate the molarities. We can just look at the number of moles. So when I look at that information, I now have my Ka again being the acid over the base. But the really nice part about it is, you can just kind of think about it, since I'm adding extra base, we know from this reaction, by adding the extra base, the addition of the OH minus would cause the H3O plus to be neutralized from the ionization of the acid, which is gonna force the reaction to go further in the forward direction. My concentration of HNO2 would drop. So because I'm adding a base, I can subtract the moles of the base. And because I'm forming more of the NO2 minus from that reaction, I can add the moles of the base down below. So I can just simply take now my Ka value, which we had as 4.5 times 10 to the minus fourth. And I can now multiply that by my new ratio, the 0 0.080 moles divided by the 0 0.105 moles. And that will tell me my new concentration of H plus. So instead of having to go divide by the 1,010 milliliters or 1.01 liters, 
to solve for the new molarities and plug that into the Henderson-Hasselbeck equation. I can just plug them in straight away into this scenario and we're all set. So if I take 4.5 times 10 to the negative fourth, multiply it by 0 0.08 and divide it by 0 0.105. Now, and I would also say before I tell the answer, because we added a base, I should expect the pH to increase from the 3.2, 3.42 that we initially started with. So when I hit that initial concentration, that brings the H plus now uh, down to 3.43 times 10 to the negative fourth. And if I take the negative log of that value for X, my new pH is going to be 3.46. So again, notice the addition of that base did not cause a large increase because again, the point of a buffer is to resist the change in pH, but it did slightly increase the pH of the solution because I neutralized some of the extra acid that was present inside. So that wraps up our video for today uh, on the buffers. This will take care of uh, the first half of our unit. Uh, the second part that we'll do is going to be involving the uh, insoluble salt equilibria. So you'll see that termed as KSP. But please uh, come to class tomorrow with questions and uh, we'll get ready for a few labs as we go. So have a great evening and there are some practice problems on the website for you.